I'm delighted to be here this morning, and I would like to invite, sort of thank the speakers for inviting me here. So convergence, it's one of those words that conjure up a hundred possibilities. Meeting of minds, two beating hearts, or is it the grand convergence of technologies that made the internet happen? Inspired by my years in science, I would like to speak to you today about a certain kind of convergence, specifically how and why some convergences can be achieved by design, while some others may happen more by way of chance. So, I'd like to think that my first brush with convergence happened when I saw my father use the magnifying glass to focus sun rays to burn a hole into paper. But the truth is it wasn't. It was this image, this picture, which must be familiar to all of you. So, so this picture must be familiar to all of you, and this is probably what we all learn in the school text. So parallel rays of light transmit through a glass lens, convex shaped, and converge at the focus. An object placed at this focus would typically have a clarity far beyond the clarity found in other places in the field of view. In fact, a very famous lens maker of the 17th century, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, who you must have heard of too, placed my microorganisms under this lens to study life, pretty much under the microscope. Now this point of convergence, the focus, is fundamental to all imaging systems, all systems at sea, including our eyes. When I was in school, I used to sort of think and associate lens with glass, convex shape, and of course, light. Now what happens is that Glass bends light, as you all know, because of a property called refractive index, which is much higher in glass than in air. The convex shape of the lens presents different facets, differently angled facets to the beam of light, and that's how they converge, how they do, and where they do. What happened was, as I grew up and I went to work, my understanding of the electromagnetic spectrum and nature of materials broadened. I figured that based on the wavelength of light, very different properties of materials could be used to focus that light. For instance, if you have a telescope to map the skies with radio waves, or think of an antenna that communicates with microwaves, they are often made of they are often made of metallic alloys, and they are often concave shaped, and they are often gridded. This happens because the wavelength of light is several centimeters long, and they are kind of impervious to these grids, the sort of gaps in the grid. Now what happens is that in the antenna or in the telescope as well, Parallel beams of light that are incident from far on these structures converge to the focus, and that is how we are able to sort of have a window to the universe with radio waves or hear each other's voices across miles. Now, what happens is that we see through our eyes and we listen through our ears and the signal that reaches our brain gets processed and reconstructed there to form an image or form a speech or some form of what we may call intelligence. We design these lenses, these telescopes or these uh, antennas, and we choose the material and we confer upon them, you know, by through casting and molding a shape that allows convergence to happen. So this is all physics, right? I mean, you're familiar with that. What happened to me was at the turn of the millennium, chance took my research from radio waves to ultrasound, to sound waves. 
Now you can do a little experiment. Let's see how they work. You tap a finger on your head, and you'll hear a sound. You tap your finger on the tummy, you'll hear much less sound. It'll be more muffled. Now ultrasound, which is, as you know, high frequency sound waves that we can't hear, operates pretty much like that. Tap with it on the head, and there'll be a lot of reflection. Tap with it on the tummy, and there'll be much, much less reflection. It turns out that we can make images of the internal organs of the body using sound waves that are reflected off them. And that's what ultrasound machines really do. Now, that on the right is an ultrasound machine. But how is the ultrasound produced? The ultrasound is produced by these objects, the left-hand side, which are called probes. Probes are made of materials that exhibit a property called piezoelectricity. And that was discovered, by the way, as you probably many of you know, by Curie brothers in the 19th century. Now, what happens in a piezoelectric crystal is that when you excite it with a voltage, it creates some mechanical wave or a pressure wave, pretty much like what's created by a tapping finger. And when you apply pressure across it, pressure on it, it creates a voltage. Now, sound waves like light waves can be bent differently by different materials. In fact, that's the reason why we can at all make ultrasound images of the internal organs of the body, because different tissue types have different acoustic impedances, and that's how reflection from them creates an image. Now, what happens is that these images get created, and then long, long back, about 50, 60 years back, the um, sort of piezoelectric membranes were concave shaped, and that's what radiated ultrasound. And when the sound waves came back from reflected echoes, they once again converged at the focus, and that's how images would be made. In the last few decades, things have changed because of digital signal processing and application specific integrated circuits. So now focusing can be done by applying time delays to waves that emanate from these tiny crystals that dot the sort of the surface of the probe. So that's how modern ultrasound machines image through convergence. Few years back, I had the chance to be, uh, you know, spend hours watching some of these machines taking scans of yet to be born babies. So what the doctors do, as many of you may have seen, is place the probe on the belly of an expectant mother and look at the fetus to see whether they are developing normally. Mothers come in different sizes and uh, so do the fetus as they grow. They also move and they kick around. And most of these machines produce ultrasound images that are in two dimension. And clinical guidelines kind of prescribe that you image certain standard, standard scan planes in two dimension because you need to look at the anatomical structure and make certain biometric measurements using a mouse-like caliper that is uh, on the screen on the machine, which the user uses. Now, a small movement of the ultrasound probe actually shifts the field of view quite sharply in ultrasound. And as I said, these objects sometimes move. So it is actually quite difficult, and it takes time and effort to bring up the standard scan plane. So the question is, how do new users of ultrasound learn to do this? So figure this out. We conducted an experiment in our lab where we um, had some new users whom we, asked, whom we taught how to use the ultrasound machine and the probe. And we, were, we asked them to scan an object, which you see on the left-hand side. That's like an object called a phantom. This particular object is a fetal phantom because it has the features of about a 20-week fetus. What you see, uh, and these phantoms are actually made of materials that mimic tissue properties, so you can actually test how ultrasound systems work with them. What you see on the right is the standard, one of the standard planes of the head of the, this fetal phantom, which looks pretty much like the head of a real phantom 
real fetus at that kind of age. And this is something that is scanned by an expert user. So this image is actually pretty good, and it meets this clinical kind of standards. So what we did was we taught these new users how to scan, and then we showed them this image and asked them to bring it up. So what did they bring up? So they were asked to scan seven times over the course of a few weeks, and each time they scanned four images each. So what do they bring up? Let's see. This is what they bring up. You can see that there is a fair amount of variability in the brightness and in the background and in the pose. So they kind of, sometimes the heads are a bit tilted and so on. And the left panel represents one user and the right panel represents the second user. And you can see that there's a fair amount of variability. Now what happens is after this round of sessions, the expert now goes and gives feedback to these people and tells them how to scan better. And they go back to scan again, and they scan seven times again over a period of time, four scans each, each time. And there's only one difference. This time, in front of them is a reference image that is scanned by the expert. And this is what the images look now. Uh, well, I have looked at them over and over again, and I think they perceptually look much more clear. We can look at the last one, and you can see this one. They look perceptually far more clear and more consistent, but if you look closer, you will find that there is still some differences in the background and the pose, that's the tilt of the head. So, what happened? Was it the feedback? Was it the reference image that changed uh, the fact that these people are learning to sort of scan better? Or was it their will? Or was it an improvement of their skill? Or is it that human beings are just designed to learn over time? And if we did this experiment with 100 new users, would we find the same pattern of learning? So this experience sort of jostled my memory. You know, when I was a child, I had these illustrated books on how the solar system came about and how the Earth was formed, and then it was warm, and then it cooled, and there was so much water, and then life sprung, and we evolved from a simple bacterium to a homo sapien. And in my mind was imprinted these two images. By the way, these are sort of, these are scanned pages of that book of mine, like years back, and you can see that the image that was imprinted in my mind was actually these hands and feet of a chimpanzee and us. And so, when I think about it, and I think of images, and I'd like you to think of images too, now these images are formed by sort of convergence that is designed. They are designed for, they are come about because of design convergence that we manufacture. And that's all because of laws of physics. What about us? We, our actions, are they the result of design or chance? And then finally, to go back to what triggered this talk, right? So what triggered this talk, I think, I think, was the theme of this event, where parallels intersect. And what is the probability you think, what are the odds that we would all be gathered on this Saturday morning, converged here, talking about convergence? So, I think, compared to the world of physics, the world of living, in the world of living, convergence is a bit more of a chance than design. Thank you. <laughs>